Okay, so uh, he, he, he was not an architect, but uh, his impact on architecture was, uh, was very important. And um, he is considered one of the most important um, Victorian uh, cultural figures, meaning the cultural figures of, of the 19th century in, in, in Great Britain. So he was born uh, on, on March 24th, was a British textile designer, poet, novelist, translator, and socialist activist associated with the British arts and crafts movement. He was a major contributor to the revival of traditional British textile arts and methods of production. His literary contributions helped to establish the modern fan fantasy genre, while he helped win, win acceptance of socialism in fin de siècle Great Britain. So quite a versatile and complex, uh, uh, complex man. And, you know, he was a great designer and he is acknowledged as a great designer during his lifetime. He was acknowledged as a great poet. But I also think his uh, politi political activism was important. His uh, uh, underlining of, of the importance of socialism. But these things should be known, you know, by architects and students in architecture, and uh, we should talk about them because it shows the example of a cultural figure who didn't, uh, you know, uh, restrict himself to only one domain. He, he tried various things, and, uh, but they, they were connected, but still very different things, textile designer, poet, novelist, translator, and social activist. Okay, this was the man, um, and you can tell he was a thinker. He was, uh, in, in fact, th this is what united all the disparate fields in which he acted. He was a thinker. Um, well, this drawing maybe doesn't do justice to him. Uh, William Morris self-portrait from 18, uh, 1856, what you saw, grew his beard that year after leaving university. This was a, uh, I think this, let, let's see, uh, this is a painting from 1858, La Belle Isolte, uh, also inaccurately called Queen of uh, Queen Guinevere, is his only surviving Isol painting, now in the Tate Gallery. The model is Jane Burden, who married Morris in 1859. So she was, <clears throat> she was <clears throat> his, uh, his wife, uh, and, uh, and, and this, is, uh, this is the painting. So the, the man did designs, uh, created textiles, uh, founded a, a firm, a company that produced those textiles. Uh, he painted, as you can see, he was very influenced by medievalism when he studied at Oxford. And indeed, uh, the neo-Gothic movement of the 19th century uh, Great Britain is, um, is uh, very much connected with the Middle Ages, with the Gothic times. There was that neo-Gothic movement in architecture. There was a great interest in uh, graphic illuminations. He himself published books with uh, illuminations. The pre-Raphaelite uh, um, artists also with whom he was friends um, um, advocated a, a world very much connected with what preceded the Renaissance. And in that sense, it was an interesting period, very interesting period. Unfortunately, in most of the world, including in our country and including in our school of architecture, the obsessions come from the post-Renaissance uh, world, not from the pre-Renaissance world, that is not from the medieval world. And, but the medieval world has great virtues and great, uh, great uh, uh, qualities which need, I think, to be known. Anyway. Uh, so uh, this one I read, uh, two of Morris' designs, snake's, sh snake's head printed textile from 1876 and peacock and dragon woven wool furnishing fabric from 1878. Um, you know, the, 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 the peacock that I see here, I keep mentioning all the time what John Ruskin said that, uh, you know, the the tail of the peacock is an example that the most beautiful things 
in, in life are also the, the, the most useless. Something again, the function is the functionalist refuses to understand. And, and, and the world of function, functionalism irritates me beyond measure because it's not adequate to our time at all. Uh, but what can we do? I, I, I mean, uh, it, it takes a long time, it seems, to, to wake up to the present. The man was a visionary. Uh, he he uh, so he combined. He was not uh, this this narrow-minded uh, little uh, you know uh, designer who just played with forms. No, he was a reformer, a social reformer. He was a very well-educated man. Again, he was a thinking man. The cover of the Socialist League's manifesto of 1885 featured art by Morris. Uh, and 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 uh, and so he, you know, you see the the Socialist League, the manifesto, the Socialist League, and uh, apparently the the drawing was done by him, the woodcut or whatever it is, the, the engraving. Um, <clears throat> there was symbolism. There was uh, myth, mythology. I, I mean. Uh, here we are dealing with a poet who uh, uh, knew a lot about uh, literature, who knew a lot about mythology. So he tried to apply that knowledge in the, in the culture of his century in various ways. Uh, here he is uh, with uh, Burne Jones, a very important uh, artist of, of uh, Victorian England. Uh, <laughs> I, I would like very much, but but you know, it, 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 I, I'm fighting with an unbelievable inertia, with an unbelievable, uh, uh, there is a, a great need for a wake up call. We have to wake up culturally. We cannot remain provincially marginalized, uh, you know, at the edge of Europe. We, we are marginalizing ourselves actually, because in today's world, it's very, very easy to um, you know, uh, have access to information, you just need to have that curiosity. I mean, look at this grown-up man. I mean, look at the, the face of uh, Burn Jones. You know, you 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 feel the curiosity, the mental uh, uh, vitality of the man on his face. He's awake. He's young. He's he's young in spirit, and we need something like this. We need cultural figures to 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 be guiding marks for ourselves. And uh, there is so much to explore, and not just in the culture of Europe, in the culture of the other continents. There is great richness, you know, in South America, in Africa, in Asia, in Australia, the Aboriginal culture. There is great source of energy to be found beyond Europe. But the schools of architecture are, 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 are paralyzed in their, in, in, their, in their dogmatic way of seeing things. You know. Ah, The Nature of Gothic by John Ruskin, printed by Kelm Scott Press, first page of text with typical ornamented border. Now, <laughs> you know, it, it amazes me that we, we keep ignoring ornamentation. You know, ornamentation is connected with a contemplative life. And yes, we eliminated contemplative life, but I think we will do greatly if we bring it back. And the pandemic seems to suggest that because the being that we move less, maybe we should contemplate more. But we still, uh, maybe we, the only thing we contemplate uh, is the soap opera on the TV screen. Troy Lewis and Chris Aid from the Ken Scott Chaucer illustrated by Burne Jones with and decorations and typefaces by Morris. Now, sorry for the resolution, but you see he was very in, in, involved also in publishing books and, uh, you know, inspired by the, the illuminated manuscripts of the Middle Ages, which are so very beautiful. And I recommend you, uh, if you want to, I suggest to you to take a look at the Book of Kells the Book of Kells, a magnificent illuminated manuscript with very intricate and, uh, and uh, elaborate um, the labyrinths of forms. And uh, it's really about the richness of the foliage of a tree, the richness of life in a way, metaphorically. Um, 
Yes, the, the art of weaving is, is very, very needed, I think, in architecture because we don't weave any longer. A wooden pattern for textile printing from William Morris Company. He founded his own company uh, to, to uh, create uh, textile, uh, uh, textiles of all kinds. This is a, um, a you know, uh, an object that, uh, that, you know, they created even today. There are, um, uh, you know, all kinds of objects, bags, uh, even shoes with Ulia Morris uh, decorations. Morris family tomb tombstone at Kelmscott designed by Philippe Webb. And we'll, I will make also after this a presentation on Philippe Webb because talking about Morris uh, uh, also benefits from talking uh, about his friend and partner, uh, Philippe Webb. Now maybe you notice there's nothing, you know, uh, I don't know, striking here. It's a tomb, tombstone, uh, but uh, still somehow a little bit original because usually uh, uh, a tombstone is, is either vertical or uh, this one is um, uh, rather simple considering uh, the, 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 the importance of the man. Anyway, the Red House, which you are going to see, which was designed by uh, Philip Webb for William Morris, but but it seems they designed it together. And it's an excellent house. Now, uh, Philip Webb was an English architect, sometimes called the father of arts and crafts architecture. His use of vernacular architecture demonstrated his commitment to the art of common building. Uh, this is the Red House, but we'll see it more in detail in, in, the, next, uh, in the next presentation. Yes, it is a it is a building uh, clearly uh, uh, deriving its uh, articulation of volumes and its aesthetics from the Middle Ages. Yet it is a, a building uh, from the 19th century, and I wouldn't mind at all if we would build a, again like this. William Morris, uh, what what is going on here? Um, No, I think I already this, uh, read this. So now we'll go through through some uh, decorations, some ornaments that that he created, some some tech, textile works. Of course, for our taste, this seems to be naive. You know, who who think of of you know representing birds? You know, uh, not. I mean, of course, ornaments we understood they are they are taboo. But uh, you know, even to have to show birds. I mean, birds. Although Ginny Gang loves birds and she does, um, uh, does uh, sometimes uh, show them in, in, in her projects. And so does an architect, a great uh, Egyptian architect about whom I will talk tomorrow. And that is uh, Hassan Fatih, <clears throat> the Egyptian Hassan Fatih, who in his projects show sometimes even a, a giant a bird on the sky or on the branch of a tree or we have to, I think it is extremely important to, to reconnect with nature and to reconnect with what we banished. We are only concerned with parking lots, with refrigerators, with escalators, we, as if the birds do not exist. I mean, our insensitivity towards nature is striking and a very, very, very sad occurrence. And things do connect, I mean, you know, if you are sensitive to nature, you begin to be sensitive to flowers, to the leaves of the trees, to birds, to bushes, to grass, to, and we ignore them. We ignore them in the name of a very uh, obsolete and dangerous anthropocentrism. As men of the, uh, uh, the measure of all things. We are not at all the measure of all things. In fact, we are on the verge of destroying the earth being so-called uh, the measure of all things. The climate is changing, the, the icebergs are melting, the seas are rising, the le level of the seas is rising, and we still claim we are the, the masters of the universe. Not to speak about pollution, which is, uh, you know, uh, a reality that we have to struggle to, um, to contain. But we are not going to contain it if we keep cutting down trees in order to make paper, in order to, to draw projects on that paper 
and then in the end to have that paper throw, thrown to the garbage. As it happens a lot in the very school here in Bucharest. Essentially, it means to throw the tree which produces oxygen directly to the garbage. And this is what is happening. And nobody says anything. It is like normal. Even, I mean, now the school is closed, but when it was opened, if you, in, in the courtyard of the school, you would see pyramids of, 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 of uh, you know, projects, papers, uh, models, uh, even books, some of them very, very nice and uh, thrown to the garbage. Welcome to sustainability. Of course, this kind of rich ornamentations is incomprehensible for us. In order to make it, you have to contemplate, you have to lose yourself in the act of, uh, you know, drawing such intricate forms. We are totally unaccustomed to this because we are in a hurry to watch the last soap opera on, on TV or to, I don't know, create the ideal uh, positioning for the refrigerator in the, in, the, in the kitchen or I don't know what kind of other prosaic uh, concern. <laughs> you know, I proposed to the school in Bucharest a few years ago to create to 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 start an, uh, a course on ornamentics. I had no reaction, no reaction at all, as if I talked about I don't know what. You know, it's it's absolutely amazing to me. You know, the the, the fact that we are not we we are actually not understanding the time we live in. Because this is not just about the 19th century. This is also about the present. The ornament is coming back. Patrick Schumacher even said structure is to become ornament and ornament is to, becoming, to become structure. The functionalist doesn't understand this. And the functionalist also ignores Louis Sullivan, the father, in a way, a functionalist who created an unbelievable ornamentation. And I'm you are going to see it today, in fact, after this. Now, of course, this kind of what we look at here, we, we think is, um, you know, old fashioned, right? It's old fashioned. What, what, what is this? A tree and flowers and leaves and what is this? You know, we are serious people. We cannot concern ourselves with such frivolous matters like a tree and flowers and the leaves. No way. The tree of life, the tree of life. Maybe we should say the parking lot of life or the refrigerator of life, not the tree of life. What is this nonsense? The tree of life. It's very possible that if someone would write the life of Buddha now, would, would convey that the Buddha uh, achieved uh, enlightenment either in the shadow of a refrigerator or in a parking lot. Certainly not under, the, under a tree. I mean, really, we are very, very prosaic and banal beings in the present, alarmingly so. Six years of study and not what a single not a single project dedicated to spirit, not a single project dedicated to either a chapel, a church, uh, commemorative temple, uh, commemorative park, nothing, nothing, nothing of uh, uh, having to do with spirit, nothing. As if the human being is just about the stomach and the pocket, about eating and making money, no spirit, no feelings, no emotions, Nothing. It's unbelievable to me. But that's why there is no interest in William Morris. He represents a world that we do not connect with. I mean, they, these men try to bring the, the tree into the center of attention through his textiles. But do we care about that tree? No. The models we make in school are all made of white polyester. Nature is not shown, most of the time, not at all. Two or three years ago, two students from the fourth year came to me to ask me if, if I would like to advise them, to talk with them about their project. 
which I did. And then they began to show me, the, you know, the site plan and the model. And then I, they show me a picture of the site in Bucharest on, from Google Maps, seen from above. And it was green. It was filled with trees. And I asked them, well, where are the trees in your model and on the site plan? They said, well, you know, they are just trees and they are not important trees. They are just Ocetari. When I hear this kind of thing, you know, what do you mean it's not an important tree? I mean, was it not made by God? Was it not made by nature? How could you say one is important and one is not? It's like uh, telling a parent who has 10 children, you know, uh, four children are important and the other six are not. The other six are Ocetari, you know, like... This, this kind of conception is unbelievable and is totally unacceptable. You know, like saying, well, it's just an Ocetar, you know, it's not an oak, you know, we can cut it down, it's, it's insignificant. But that Ocetar produces oxygen, okay, which we need badly, I mean badly. And we cut it down. Why? Out of ignorance and out of lack of sensibility. That's why. Because we don't realize that Ocetar is a, is, a, is a wonder. It's a miracle, just like a blade of grass. I told the professor in the school, to Stefan Simeon, I said, for me, a blade of grass is more important than the Parthenon. Of course, I wanted to be provocative, but then I explained myself because he was astonished. I said, yes, a blade of grass is alive. It grows towards light. It springs, it, it, it breaks. The, the, the strata of, uh, of, of snow in the spring, it, it, it grows towards light. No building in the world, doesn't matter how incredible, grows towards light. The Parthenon is not alive, metaphorically it might be, but not factually, while a blade of grass is alive. But we have to understand this, to, to understand the miracle of a blade of grass. A blade of grass is a miracle. And now we step on that blade of grass as if it is nothing. Anyway, beautiful trees, beautiful ornaments, beautiful decorations, beautiful intricacies, a beautiful mental attitude towards nature and towards life that we don't have because we lost our soul. That's why, you know, for us, a parking lot is more important. We should banish the cars. It is because of the cars that we have so much pollution in the world. A, a lot comes from it. Okay, now, you know, I'm going, I'm changing plans. I will show you a presentation about architecture and weaving because it, it's, it's a subject that interests me a lot. And I think I, I, I'll show the, the, the actuality, the, the, the relevance of, of weaving for us today. Uh, and it, it, it is not just for, for us and not only for today, but anyway, architecture and weaving, because William Morris was very concerned with weaving with, and with textiles and even abstract. Architect, the word, the very word architect comes from the middle French architect from Latin architectus, from Greek architecton, master builder, director of works. The first part, R-A-R-K-H, from archi, which means chief, and tecton, which means builder and carpenter, see texture. This I took from Wikipedia. And uh, old English word for it was uh, uh, crafting, uh, anyway, high crafter. So texture comes from, uh, I mean, means network uh, structure, but is more to it. You'll see from Middle French texture and directly from Latin textura, web, texture, structure from stem of texere, which means to weave in the uh, Proto-Indo-European root tex, which means to weave, to fabricate, to make, make weaker or wetter framework. Uh, I will not go all in this because we'll have a diagram which shows very clearly how things um, how things go. Look at this. All the derivations of the word architect or architecture come from text, which means to weave. 
all of them in all languages. So obviously the act of weaving was the primal archaic, the Ur gesture in architecture. The first architectonic gesture was to weave. And I will explain why when, if I hope I have here in this presentation, um, something about Gottfried Zemper. If not, I will, uh, I will uh, talk outside of the presentation. But before I do that, I want to show five goddesses of weaving that interestingly, they were all goddesses. There was no god of weaving, just goddesses, only feminine gods. In other words, goddesses, Ishtar. Here she is, Ishtar in Mesopotamia. Lilith, Lilith, the primeval woman before Eva, before Eve. Apparently, uh, Michelangelo depicted Eva here, or Eve, giving the apple to Eve. I mean, this is Lilith, the, you know, the culmination in a way of the snake. She gives the, the apple to Eve, and Michelangelo de apparently depicted the, the snake uh, uh, with uh, with uh, with the body of a woman, and this woman apparently is the primordial woman. The woman before before Eva or Eve was created from the bone of Adam, the wild woman, the woman who refuses to to be in the kitchen and cook for the male who watches TV or reads newspaper. We need badly back Lilith, I think, that primordial woman who refuses to be, accept that she was created from the bone of the man. Let the man be created from the bone of the woman for, for a change. Neith, the Egyptian goddess of weaving, Arachne, the beautiful Arachne, and I will talk with emotions about Arachne, was a mortal in ancient Greece and she, uh, she was invited by Athena, a goddess, to a competition, who is the best weaver, and she won, Arachne won, and because of it, uh, the, the jealous, the envious uh, um, Athena transformed her into a spider. Uh, uh, look, this is the engraving with, uh, with Dante in, 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 the, in, the, in, in Inferno, in the Inferno, uh, and you see Arachne transformed by, um, punished by Athena into a spider. Uh, and I, will, I hope I have in this presentation a more elaborate um, uh, story about Ar Arachne because she's very, very, very important. Uh, Frigg for the Scandinav Scandinavians, again, the goddess of weaving. And you see her indeed weaving. Durga. For the Hindus, also the goddess of, of, of weaving. Are we talking these days about gods and goddesses? Of course not. We are enlightened human beings, right? We don't need gods and goddesses. We don't need mythology. We don't need all this nonsense, right? But our lives are extremely impoverished because of it. This is a drawing, or a, I don't know exactly what it is, by Lebia Suds. It's some kind of a neurotical weaving. And here, what do we see? We see men weaving. <laughs> These are all criminals in a Brazilian prison weaving. They were given a deal if they, I don't know, if they made how many sweaters or socks or I don't know why, what they were weaving, they would, be, <laughs> they, would, they would be given a chance to leave prison uh, earlier. I find this picture extremely amusing, you know. Here you have criminals and I don't know why they were wearing uh, those uh, masks, because at uh, that time, I mean, this picture I took uh, a few years ago before the pandemic. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but, but to have here, you have, uh, you know, five uh, criminals, you know, weaving, uh, I, 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 it gives me hope, actually, in the world. Anyway, weaving in Paris. Uh, weaving in Vienna, the project of a student in the uh, Taiyue Institute of Architecture, a uh, brick in the woven structure of a sweater, and even the, those, those uh, wounds, I think, are nice. And they can be repaired, as, as um, uh, Aldous Huxley said in The Brave New World, he was sarcastic towards The Brave New World, and there is a chorus in The, in the Brave New World which keeps repeating, 
ending is better than mending, ending is better than mending, ending is better than mending. But actually what he meant was that mending is better than ending, but the brave new world doesn't think so because it's about production, right? Production, production, production. We don't repeat, we don't repair things. We just, uh, uh, you know, uh, create new things. And then the old ones we throw to the garbage. But I think in the act of mending a, swe a, a sock or a, a sweater, something happens. And uh, this is a subject in itself that interests me a lot. And maybe we'll talk some other time about it. Weaving, uh, weaving. Uh, you have in, in the act of weaving two, two threads, uh, the warp thread and the weft uh, thread. And uh, the, the weft thread is the rebellious one in a way. It creates the, the ornamental design in the structure of weaving. While warp is the, represents the, the yeah in a way the structural background on which the weft uh, thread dances. This is the pavilion of Benedetta Taliabue uh, of Spain at the, in Shanghai at the Shanghai International uh, Exhibition uh, from I think 2008 or 2012. This is a strange neurotical kind of weaving by uh, Francois Roche, uh, weaving architecture. Weaving is also connected with uh, with a knot, uh, and uh, and the knot is uh, is uh, an emblem of, of of the unknown. Of course, the rationalist trembles because the rationalist doesn't like what what I see here. The rational says uh, rationalist says, wait a minute. You make me throw away the T square and the rectangle. What am I going to do with this, uh, with this, uh, you know, so-called irrational structure? But uh, here is actually the, the former queen of Romania, who was also very fond of, uh, of, of weaving. Uh, and here is here is actually Arachne. Uh, I hope I have. Uh, unfortunately, I have to I have to change this presentation because it's it's not very well organized. But I hope I can shed some light on this. So Arachne, um, but I, maybe I anticipate. Let me go a little further because I think it should be. I didn't look at this presentation in some time and I forgot if I talk in detail about Arachne or not, but I think I should a little later. Anyway, uh, weaving again, uh, weaving, uh, weaving, weaving. This was built, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, was, was built and was built from a different um, with a different uh, state of mind, so to speak, from the state of mind of the one who uses a T-square and a rectangle. It's clear. It, it's a different kind of bringing together. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of thing that the birds do when they, when they build a nest. You know, it, it, it is a different form of, of, of bringing to life something architectural with a different conception about bringing together something could happen. Um, but here again, we, we, we see the, the, the world as a labyrinth because the labyrinth is also connected with weaving. Here is a, um, a tent which becomes also a dress or the dress could become a tent. And the, the relationship between the dress and the tent, meaning the house in a way, is very interesting. You know, because uh, there are architects, there were architects who thought, uh, like Ralph Arsky, Erskine, for example, that the house is in a way an extension of the clothing. In this case, it's literally so. The dress could become a tent, a miniature house. I, this I created, I created for myself a list of ap approximations relating to, I call them conceptual threads. Bristle architecture, bio knitting and psycho knitting, to will versus at atropos, unweaving, irregular meshes, betrayed symmetries, knots, nests, and meshes, interstices, biotextiles, biotext, architectural regs, desultory architecture. I even forgot since I wrote it what it means. Neural entanglements, quantum consciousness, histologic architecture, wrinkled architecture. Just think about this, a wrinkled architecture. Do we think of the such matters? Of course not. Architecture, 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 
constellative architecture, unraveled threads, discontinuous architecture. There is a, a vast area of, uh, to be explored if you, if you uh, start conceiving architecture as being primarily uh, a weaving activity. Um, so I, I only show here some images that are taken from the contemporary uh, uh, you know, concerns, so to speak, with, with, with weaving. And uh, the, uh, the newest uh, digital uh, techniques that are available to us allow us to, to actually uh, create some very complex structures that are woven. I think these are projects from, uh, from uh, the class read by uh, Francois Roche, if I'm not mistaken. They experiment, they experiment, and we don't experiment. And it is a tragedy because the intelligence and the imagination of our students is not encouraged. It should, architecture should be an adventure, an exploration of the unknown, not the, of the known, because in fact, there is nothing to explore in the known. Exploration has to happen in the field of the unknown. Just as they say a Sayark, to hell with regulations, we are going for the unknown. And what, be, what could be more exciting than to go towards the unknown, to become a pioneer, to know that you are discovering something, for God's sake, and not Ernest Neufert. I'm tired of that man. <laughs> Although apparently he liked... Uh, uh, Antoni Gaudi, but uh, his work it was, um, it made sense when he wrote it, but enough is enough, you know. Um, with all his prescriptions, you know, why shouldn't a, a stair also have, uh, you, know, the, you know, the dimensions of the steps uh, different, uh, differently than, than the Neufert asked? Why, why not? Make, bring discomfort, but that discomfort could be very fruitful for the joy and the pain because they are good re relatives, as uh, Leonardo said. Pain and pleasure are twins. Neufert killed both. It killed the pain, but it also killed pleasure in the name of so-called ergonomics and you know efficiency and all the rest. I'm really tired of, of Neufert. It should be banished from... Uh, from all architecture schools. It should be made illegal, really. It, 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 took, it took away all the discovery, you know, everything is written down, you know, everything. I grew up, grew up in Sibiu. In Sibiu, uh, the, you know, all those beautiful houses in the old town uh, were built without Neufert. And they are great. They are great. I live there, I grew up there. I can testify to it. Look here how the, how the building becomes nature. Well, it becomes nature thanks to the new technologies that we have. And it is about weaving. Anyway, this subject uh, deserves, uh, and uh, I, sometimes I talk about it and I, I, I think uh, um, we, have to, we have to explore more because truly the weaving is very, very important for architecture. We still have words, even in Romanian, like Cesutul uh, Urban, right? We still have it, but very rarely we, we, we weave these days, very, very rarely. Look at this, you know. Now, what do you do here with a T-square and a rectangle? You tell me. They're totally useless. You know, this obsession with a T-square <laughs> as being uh, the basic, uh, the basis of architecture is totally uh, ridiculous because the T-square apparently was invented in the 11th century, the 11th century. But there was a lot of human history before the 11th century when apparently there were no T-squares. T yes, I'm sure they had tools. Maybe there was even some kind of an approximation of a T-square, but the architect, uh, you know, enslaved by uh, its majesty, the T-square, sitting at the drafting board, that is rather a post-Alberti uh, occurrence. And, uh, okay, 
I'm so glad that I arrived here because because this is extremely important. I, I, I hope I, I am inspired enough to convey quickly and efficiently why it is so important. Arachne and Athena. Now, Athena, as you know, was the goddess of wisdom and war in ancient Greece. But what is very interesting about Athena, and I don't know if you know this, I learned myself very late this, she sprang from the head of Zeus without a mother, just like Jesus sprang from the womb of a mother, of his mother, without actually a biological father. It's very interesting, this relationship between Athena and Jesus, both monoparented. But let's, let's begin with Arachne. Arachne was a Lydian girl famous for her excellent weaving and embroidery. Ah, architecture would be beautiful again if we bring back weaving and embroidering. The tapestries she designed were so beautiful that the nymphs used to come to admire them. Everyone thought that Arachne received her skill as a gift from Athena, the patron of spinners and embroiderers. But Arachne, Arachne refused to attribute her talent to anyone but herself and challenged the goddess to a contest. So I was wrong initially. Actually, uh, Arachne challenged Athena to a contest. Athena accepted the challenge. Arachne made the perfect work, but the theme of her tapestry was insulting for the gods. Athena, outraged with a mortal skill and impudent behavior, struck Arachne with a shuttle and turned her into a spider, which spins and weaves until it has no more thread. Now, I will explain why Arachne was uh, accused of impudent behavior. And she was insulting for the gods. Apparently, from what I read, Arachne showed in her tapestry the infidelities of Zeus, the Zeus being the father of Athena. And uh, Athena was defending the cheating uh, god, to put it in a non-academic language, uh, because she was born from the head, and interestingly, from the head, meaning from the brain of Zeus. Uh, we'll, we'll see pictures of that. This is a, a, a Arachne. We saw this. Here is, an, I think, painted by Veronese. Uh, Arachne. Uh, Arachne, again, weaving, weaving, and weaving. Uh, here they are, the two of them. Uh, on the left, Athena. On the right, Arachne. Uh, so, Athena. Athena is the Greek virgin goddess of reason, inter intelligent activity, arts and literature. Athena is the daughter of Zeus. She sprang full grown in armor, I underline, in armor, from his forehead, thus has no mother. She is fierce and brave in battle, but only worse uh, to, uh, to define, uh, to, to be defined maybe, the state and home from outside enemies. Uh, this is not uh, correct English, sorry. She's the goddess of the city, handicrafts and agriculture. She invented the brittle, which permitted men to tame horses, the trumpet, the flute, the pot, the rake, the plow, the yoke, the sheep and the chariot. She's the embodiment of wisdom, reason and purity. She was Zeus' favorite child and was allowed to use his weapons, including his thunderbolt. Her favorite city was Athens. Her tree, the olive tree, the owl is her bird. She's a virgin goddess. But I dislike Athena. I can tell you why. So here you see uh, Athena is in a way the alter ego of Zeus. His daughter, Born, her, uh, her, uh, his, uh, his daughter, but born from his head without a mother. In my opinion, look here on the vase, uh, uh, Greek vase. She springs from the head of Zeus, already armed, already ready to fight. She was a fighter. And in my opinion, Athena represents the road taken and Arachne represents the road not taken. And I will say, I'll explain this further. Here we see again, we see Zeus and we see Arachne springing from his head. In other words, from his cerebellum, from his brain, not from his heart, from his brain. So this is the male and the female who, whom he gives birth to is actually defending his cerebrality 
and in a way his heartlessness. Uh, and, uh, and this is what happened. Here she is again, springing from the head of the male of Zeus to defend his conception about the world, which is the cerebral, cerebralist conception of the world. Again, she springs from the head of Zeus, from, you see, from the brain, from the head. Of course, there were great temples dedicated to her because, of course, she was the, the supreme goddess. While Athena was trans, uh, while uh, Arachne was uh, transformed into a miserable, uh, you know, insect, uh, you know, uh, scrolling on the floor and uh, and uh, reduced to to an underground kind of life. So what I what do I see here? I see men. That very man that the Bible says that gave birth to Eve from his bone, here we have Zeus giving birth to the woman from his head to defend him, to, de to defend his male interests. This is not a feminist story, in as much as the bi biblical story is not a feminist story. It's a masculine story. It's a masculinist story. I mean, I wonder how the men would feel if they knew they were born from the bone of a woman, if Adam was born from the bone of Eva. But no, of course, the theologians who wrote the Bible decided, of course, that the woman was born from the bone of Adam, Adam and not vice versa. Uh, so from the beginning, we are dealing with a masculine masculine story. It's clear. Arachne. Arachne. I think I already read this. Uh, I, sh I, I, uh, I have to. I have to be care careful not to read uh, um, again. Maybe this is a different. Uh, uh, I, I, um, I shouldn't. I shouldn't complicate matters to read too much. Arachne. Arachne. Also, you'll see in modern mythology, uh, if I can call it so, we have the spider woman right in the, in the, in the, in the, in the films uh, in Hollywood. So there are reverberations of Arachne because Arachne represents the road not taken, but it's, it still exists. We cannot neglect it. Arachne is, uh, represents the, the road of, 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 of uh, I wouldn't say unreason. It really uh, represents weaving, and weaving was 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 erased from our mentality because Athena represented the rationalism dictated by the brain of her father, meaning meaning uh, Zeus. Uh, we are afraid of uh, spiders, right? Everybody is afraid of spiders. Spiders represent psychologically the dark side. But that dark side of the uh, symbolized by the spider is a reality of life, and it shouldn't be neglected. It is connected with with uh, with with Ar Arachne. You see modern variations. Look, the spider woman, sensuous and all. Uh, the spider man. We even have a spider man. Uh, animal weavers. We see now a few animal weavers. But this subject, architecture and weaving, I, I have to create a new PowerPoint presentation. This is a sketch, and uh, it leaves out some important things. Godfrey Zemper, in particular. But I will talk about Godfrey Zemper uh, after uh, we go through some. Look, look at this. I mean, look at this beautiful builder. Without a diploma from Inku, without a doctorate in architecture, she built this thing that we cannot build. How do you explain it? She didn't have a T-square. She didn't have training in structures, in whatever. She didn't study, you know, uh, have a course in, uh, uh, you know, Studio Forme. And look what she built. How, how was it possible? Can you explain to me? First of all, who gave the bird the right to signature? How did she sign? How did it sign its project? Wait a minute. She didn't have a project? No, she didn't. She built it without a project. How could this be possible? Well, it is possible, and it is magnificent. I mean, who taught the bird, you know, uh, statics, uh, you know, about gravity? <laughs> Can you explain? And there is Imhotep, the first architect ever, that bird. 
I mean, you know, these animals, they create unbelievable things and you wonder how do they do it? Because they are supposed to not know, they are supposed to be stupid, right? Animals, but they are not, they are not. Like for example, if I have a little insect move on the floor and I approach my dangerous uh, shoe because I want to, you know, eliminate it and it feels, even if when I'm close to it, it, it runs away, it feels. How do you explain it? It means it's not so stupid as we might think it is. And these builders were, what can we say? First of all, you know, they chose, so they didn't build a cube. They didn't, it seems that the round form is more, uh, it's closer actually, even uh, economically to, uh, you know, to, to create a, a structure that is, uh, um, you know, self-contained, self-sustained, uh, even in African villages, there are beautiful round houses uh, that that you wonder why were they built round and not square? Because we are taught in schools that it's not economical to be on the round to build round buildings, you know, like cylinders and so on. Well, it seems the the animals have different instincts, and so do the wise builders of other cultures. Look, a tent, right? In the Arab culture, the tent has woven uh, parts of the tent, everything is woven. And uh, I, I would say it's a very pleasant uh, uh, environment. Oh, I'm so happy that Sullivan is here. So Sull Sullivan, Louis Sullivan, the one who said form follows function, the one who was the father of functionalism in a way and uh, of the um, cerebral Cartesian uh, uh, office tower. You will see incredible ornaments created by the very same man who said form follows function. Sullivan, 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 Sullivan. What does the functionalist say when, when he sees these images? Again, we are talking about the paradigmatic father of functionalism, right? Louis Sullivan, form follows function. But look what ornaments he created, and not only he created, he um, externalized them uh, on the skin of his buildings. I mean, these were put into practice, into, into, the, into his buildings. This exists in Chicago, this building. Uh, uh, what made Louis Sullivan be unhappy? This is a facsimile, well, the image is not facsimile, but I have the book with his ornaments. I keep telling the students and I keep telling myself as well, to create an ornament is very, very liberating, is very, very, and very interesting exercise. You know, because you, you in a way you externalize your own soul in, in, in the ornament. So I invite anyone who wants to experiment and now the pandemic uh, kind of uh, uh, creates the conditions for that to happen Create a new ornament, create an ornament, an ornament that is yours. Don't look in books, don't copy ornaments from other, you know, eras or places or now. Create one from within yourself, just as Louis Sullivan did. These were very original works. Uh, and uh, he, he started from natural principles, but you see also the connection with William Morris. Yes, of course, Louis Sullivan lived and worked in the 19th century and a little bit in, in, in the 20th century. He was a little bit younger than William Morris, but still it was a concern with the labyrinth, with the intricate forms, with the Book of Kells, with the medievalism, uh, with the Gothic times, with contemplation, with everything that modernity and rationalism rejected. Louis Sullivan, and he was one of the three forefathers of modern North American architecture, the other two being H.H. H. Richardson and Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright, who his first job was in the office of Adler and Sullivan. Sullivan hired him, although he had only less than two years of study in a technical school. That's all Frank Lloyd Wright studied in the field of architecture. And he just showed a drawing to Louis Sullivan and Louis Sullivan told him, you are hired. And uh, he did the right thing. Uh, again, Sullivan. 
Sullivan. Why is this not being taught in schools? Why do the schools are, why are they silent about the other side of Louis Sullivan? Because it's inconvenient, because it, it, it is, uh, you know, uh, fighting off the dogma. That's why the functionalist, uh, you know, uh, collapses. This man was creating the peacock's tail to refer to John Ruskin, who said the most beautiful things in the world are the most useless. You would say, wait a minute, these this ornaments indeed are useless. So we cannot do this, Neufer to do, do rebel, Neufer to do, become totally mad in, the, in his grave. To hell with Neufer. Look at Sullivan, he created beauty. Beauty, yes, beauty, this word which is so simple and so old fashioned and so beautiful, we need beauty. Even Dostoevsky said clearly, beauty will save the world. The functionalist says, no, we need a correctly dimensioned parking lot and a, a perfect positioning of the refrigerator in the kitchen. No beauty. We are not interested in beauty, no. Architecture has nothing to do with beauty, no, no. Why should it? Computer drawings, now these are, um, I showed them before and I apologize to those who already saw them. These are drawings done by me with the first computer I ever bought uh, from a Salvation Army in the United States with $50, I bought everything. The computer, the software, the Oki data, uh, dot printer, uh, everything, even the original Apple bag. Uh, something that uh, a few years earlier was $5,000, I bought it 50. And I began to play with that primal computer in 1987. And you'll see a few drawings. That computer was damaged. I sent it by a plane. The hardware was, was smashed. I don't have it any longer, but I have a few pages that I printed with uh, essentially ornamental works, which I did uh, at that time without knowing about William Morris and uh, uh, Arachne. And, uh, but I, I, still, I still like this, these pages that I still have. And I, one, one, at one time I, I showed them to a computer wizard from California. Uh, I asked him, how do you think I did this? computer drawings. And he looked at them and he said, I have no idea. It must be a very sophisticated computer from Europe. I said, no, I did it with, a, with the least powerful computer in the world. Apple uh, Mac Plus, uh, it had only one uh, uh, megabyte of memory. One, can you believe it? Megabyte, not gigabyte. One megabyte was in black and white. And that's how I did these drawings. And I, I still like them, to be honest with you. Anyway, ornamental, I was playing, but you cannot divorce work from play. That's the big problem. That's what the functionalist doesn't understand. You cannot create anything unless you marry work with play. You have to be playful. You have to bring in joy. And I, I pronounce now the ultimate, uh, uh, you know, illegal word, play. Uh, no, well, play on one hand and joy. Joy, yes, joy. How could we create anything in the absence of joy? I was joyous when I was doing these things, to be honest with you. I was joyous. And I'm not saying they are great things. I'm just show, showing that if you are playful in what you do, you could arrive at certain things that are, yes, they, they, they bring you joy. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, isn't joy in, 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 in the end what matters the most? If we could bring joy to ourselves and to other people through our works, is it not what should be actually the, the, the goal of, of, of our activity? Anyway, I'm not going to read this. I have a whole, uh, um, I have a very rich material about architecture and weaving. I move forward, but, but the weaving is connected with many things, entanglement, with a, with a knot, as I said, with the world as a labyrinth, and by the way, of the world of the labyrinth, uh, or, or yeah, uh, there is a great, great, great book which you can find. I'm talking to Romanians here in Bucharest, and the, the secondhand bookstore is called Lumiaca Labyrinth uh, uh, of, by Gustav René Hoque, uh, and it's a beautiful book with a great foreword by uh, Andrei Pleshu. I highly recommend that book to anyone who loves art, architecture, and the labyrinth. 
we see here also images of the unknown, essentially, you know, and uh, and, uh, and the unknown is, is 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 inviting us actually more, in my opinion, than than the known. To weave, I'm not going to read this. There are many many examples of 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 the spider in architecture because, in a way, we are talking about it about the weaving, the web the web of the spider and, and architecture, which is also about complexity and the complexity which refuses the, you know, the simplisms of, of rationalism. Uh, this is just a, like a quick ad memoir of various uh, kinds of weaving. Uh, the subject is indeed very vast. We are approaching the end of this uh, presentation on, on weaving. And uh, if you are still here with me, I can, I can talk now about Philippe Webb, uh, the friend of, of, uh, of um, William Morris, the architect who built the house of uh, William Morris. So now we go to Philippe Webb. Uh, an arts and crafts uh, uh, move, move uh, architect uh, in in Victorian uh, in Victorian England. Although you see, he lived until 1915. So Philip Speakman Webb was an English architect, sometimes called the father of arts and crafts architecture. His use of vernacular architecture demonstrated his commitment to the art of common building. This was the man, Philip Webb, uh, and. Uh, you know, such architects should, should be known. We should know of them. We should study them because they were very important and they still are drawings. Uh, sorry, the resolution is not great for some of them. But uh, anyway, again, this was 19th century. Uh, it was not uh, the 20th century. It was not the 21st century. It was the 19th century. We might think that these things are naive or I don't know how. But, um, you know, um, things are, I think, more complex than that. The Red House. This is the house he built for William Morris. So today it is the birthday of William Morris. And he built Philip Webb. He was actually the architect. He built it together and for William Morris. Um, this is the house. Uh, obviously, Philippe Webb was influenced by the Middle Ages, by the Gothic times, in as much as other architects of Victorian England were, and was a very interesting period, I think, the Victorian age. Uh, it, it was a romantic, in a way, uh, attitude vis-a-vis -vis life, vis-a-vis -vis architecture, uh, you know, a belief in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in nature, in, in the Gothic cathedral, in the brick wall, in the sloping roof, uh, you know, it, it is indeed an architecture that is uh, not rationalist. is uh, is a different kind of architecture, and I'm a believing craft. Uh, um, there were other architects, not just Philippe Webb, who worked in this way. But this was the house where William Morris lived for about twenty years with his wife. It's not a little house. It's not a little house in the forest. William Morris was a man of means. But uh, being a man of means didn't preclude him from advocating socialism. So <clears throat> again, <clears throat> the house was built by Philip Webb for his friend William Morris. But they worked together, something that William Morris also had a word in the design of the house. You will see a few other buildings by Philip Webb in this presentation. The plan doesn't have the richness of the actual reality of the building. The plan is, you know, if you see this plan, you wouldn't actually visualize easily what the, what the, actual, the actual building looked like, you know, like, like here. How come that from that plan, from this plan, they were able to make this build? I think it's a good question, a legitimate question, because the rationalist, 
post effort with such a plan would create a completely different building, not this one. So this is the Red House, and it is a very well-known building in the history of uh, modern architecture. Modern, although it was pre-modern in a way, it was, uh, you know, Victorian England. Now another uh, big house that Philippe Webb built, I don't know if he's still alive. Uh, he built uh, several important buildings. This one is in London, 1862. This is a, a row of buildings, actually. It's not a single uh, house. But I think it's still impressive. Uh, it has force. It has rhythm. It has, uh, I don't know, uh, it, it's, it, it, it has even a, a certain modernity, I would say. A different kind of modernity, of course, compared to this, but uh, still. Uh, so this is Philip Webb. <clears throat> Another house <clears throat> rebuilt in 1937. Maybe it burned down, but it looks like this one <laughs> had a fire as well. Um, AS architecture is prone to uh, possible um, uh, fires and, and all kinds of tragedies. Another one, this one a little bit different. Uh, the use of the brick is was extensive in the Victorian uh, architecture. And I, I almost, it crossed my mind now that the, the brick maybe is the material par excellence of socialism. Because, you know, the socialism of a wall where you place a brick above another brick and they're all equal, all these bricks, and they, they, they together create a wall. So there is the democracy of the brick. I would um, maybe uh, fantasize to, to, to use such a language. Red Barnes House. Uh, this is another red house, but not the one where William Morris uh, lived. This one seems to be abandoned or, I don't know, uh, neglected or temporarily in this state. Great, uh, great houses, great buildings. Uh, this is a townhouse. Um, impressive itself in its own way. Color not being the only uh, positive attribute that it has. The West House in London, um, also red, also uh, brick, also, um, you know, uh, having a subtle clam towards the past. Some of these houses. Um, were restored uh, with more or less skill. But all in all, Philippe Webb, the friend of William Morris, uh, who also designed the gravestone of William Morris, uh, is an architect who, uh, worth considering. And they had so many in Victorian England, my God, my God. Four Gables, Green Lane House in Cumbria. I personally like the Gothic architecture and such buildings do not leave me indifferent. And actually, I don't know of anyone who doesn't like uh, all the medieval the towns or villages or no, it's, it's something about the, the medieval world which is still uh, uh, stirring us uh, up our imagination and even the imagination of Walter Gropius, the founder of the Bauhaus. Because in his little manifesto from 1919, Walter Gropius talks about, uh, surprise, surprise, the Cathedral of Socialism. The last word of that little manifesto is faith. The word heaven is used twice. And he says that artists are exalted craftsmen. The word exalted, this is a word which is not uh, really one of, uh, uh, of, of the predilect words of rationalism. Is it a church? 
well, churches are churches. They had so many built uh, in, in, in the 19th century. My God, they, they probably more churches than uh, even than uh, the churches built in Bucharest. I was a little bit sarcastic, but it's true. A lot of churches came into being in, in Romania after 1989. Too bad that not, too ve not very original. Cloud House, now this one is a little bit heavy and classicist, somehow neoclassical almost. I don't like it, but it's not for me to like it. A castle even, I don't know, do we need castles? I don't know. It's truly a program which is rather obsolete for me. Uh, West Sussex House, another house uh, with the big, big uh, celebrations of fire. As you can see, without them, what would we do? You know, the architecture would become rather banal. Uh, the chimneys uh, play a significant role, and um, as they do at Chambord, uh, much more emphatically, of course. Anyway, this is Philippe Webb. We are approaching the end of this short presentation on him. He deserves, uh, even he deserves a, a better, a better, longer presentation. But now I rush a little bit because I, I would also like to end with, with Owen Jones, the great uh, decorativist ornamentalist or ornamentalist of the of the 19th century. But. Coming back to weaving, I do believe that if you weave, you have a chance to join. And it's really, in essence, about bringing together, about only connecting. If you can connect, then you, you, you achieve that uh, adoration of the joint that um, uh, Kenneth Frampton talked about when he wrote about Carlos Carpa. If you can connect, if you just connect, you know, you weave actually, if you can weave in your project, uh, you know, at all levels, within a room, uh, you, you weave your building within the, the urban structure where you place your building and so on. This is uh, another, you know, monumental mansion. I don't know if it still exists. Nice old pictures, time passes, one day will pass too. What can we do? The life marches on although the pandemic is uh, uh, kind of uh, trying to oppose that march, but uh, let's hope we'll find a solution to it. Now, this is some kind of an Arcadia you know, the poor of the world do not live like this. Usually people of some you know, means, uh, you know, can, can afford to, to live in beautiful landscapes, uh, white landscapes and so on. It's true. The inequalities of the world persist. Okay, and now if you want to end uh, our trip into the world of William Morris or his connections with, uh, or in, in essence, with textile works, and with um, with um, with ornament, but before I I I, I present now uh, I present now another architect from the 19th century, very connected with ornament. I would like to say something about um, why is the textile gesture in architecture the first the first one. It seems I, 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 I am tempted to agree with Gottfried Zemper, the 19th century German uh, architect and theoretician who built significantly both in Germany and in, 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 in Vienna, in Vienna, in Austria, but also in Switzerland. He said like this, that the first house that ever came into being was in this way. Uh, 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 some um, hunters and fishermen returned from work and they gathered around the fire. They didn't yet have a house. There was not, not a house yet built. And they understood fire is very, very important to preserve that fire because it, you know, it was necessary to cooking, to warming and so on. But they, they didn't know how to make a, a house. They saw that around them there were bushes and trees, but they didn't have the tools to cut down trees. So they just took branches of bushes and trees and they began to weave them. 
and they created the first wall, which was actually a rather flexible kind of textile work, a panel from woven vegetable material. And that's, that's, that's why he thought, Zemper, that the textile, the weaving of, you know, uh, plants, uh, leaves, large leaves, uh, branches of bushes and trees, weaving them was the first architectural gesture. So that's why the textile work, weaving, is considered of a primal importance in architecture. But what is the relationship between weaving or ornamentation? Well, we could ask anyone, a grandmother or anyone who, who, who embroiders a sweater, why does she include often an ornamental design in the weaving of that sweater? Because in the act of weaving, or embroidering something, you kind of lose yourself just like a child loses himself when he plays. Adolf Loss even talks about the Slovak, Slovak, uh, Slovak uh, uh, or Slovenian uh, peasant woman who loses herself, in other words, in contemplation while she embroiders something. And so weaving and ornamentation are connected through the art, uh, act of contemplation. Uh, the subject is, is complex and serious, and I think it deserves a, a separate uh, discussion at a later time. But let's see a little bit Owen Jones, who was very famous and is continues to be very famous for his total dedication to ornament. Uh, he was an architect in uh, Victorian England. So he was born in 18, 1809 and died in 1974, was an English-born Welsh architect, a versatile architect and designer. He was also one of the most influential design theorists of the 19th century. He helped pioneer modern color theory and his theories on flat patterning and ornament still resonate with contemporary designers today. He rose to proeminence with his studies of Islamic decoration at the Alhambra and the associated publication of his drawings, which pioneered new standards in chromolithography. Jones was a pivotal figure in the formation of the South Kensington uh, Museum, which later became the Victoria and Albert Museum. Through his close association with Henri Cole, the museum's first director and another key figure in the 19th century design reform. Jones was also responsible for the interior decoration and layout of exhibits for the great exhibition building of 1851 and for its later incarnation at uh, Sydenham. Jones advised on the foundation collections for the South Kensington Museum. Anyway, uh, I wouldn't read all of this, but what is important is that he created the grammar of ornament. These designs, propositions, also form the basis for his seminal publication, The Grammar of Ornament, totally ignored for us today. The global and historical design source book for which Jones is perhaps best known today. Jones believed in the search for a modern style unique to the 19th century, radically different from the prevailing aesthetics of neoclassicism and the Gothic revival. He looked towards the Islamic world for much of his, of his inspiration, using his studies of Islamic decoration at the Alhambra to develop theories on flat patterning, geometry, and abstraction in or, an ornament. And now we see uh, certain things, Alhambra ornaments. I want to show some things from Alhambra that inspired uh, Owen Jones. Now, again, what made the builders of the Alhambra spend time and energy and resources to create such uh, patterns? What? What do you think? Because we don't have, a, uh, uh, it is as if we are different species. We, we are not interested in this sort of thing. We certainly cannot do something like this. Why? I mean, we could, of course, we have the, the abilities, we have the tools more than they did. But we don't have the, 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 same, uh, uh, the, the same attitude vis-a-vis -vis contemplation. We think that uh, our walls cannot be like this. But what is wrong with these walls? What is wrong with this beauty? Because it is beauty here. 
And I don't think there is anyone in the world who would say that there isn't. Owen Jones was not, uh, the, the, he didn't belong to Islam, but he was seduced as I was when I visited Alhambra. Uh, actually, I was more seduced about the incredible wisdom and sensitivity of the Arab gardeners when they, they handled so exquisitely the, the, the water they worked with. I mean, the art of uh, gardening in the Arab garden and the way they employ water is, is immensely uh, delicate and sensitive and, and, and very, 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 very fine. Uh, it just like just like this architecture, just look at this, you know. I mean, can we separate structure from ornament here? Not really. I mean, here the structure becomes ornament and the ornament becomes structure. Look at this, it is magnificent. But this is not shown in the schools of architecture, of course not, because with a T-square and a rectangle, you cannot, you cannot do something like this. Look at this. Of course, Owen Jones was seduced by, by the, the incredible beauty and complexity of this world. I am too, and many people are. But, you know, it takes a different kind of sensibility to, 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 to be able to aspire, to long towards something like this. Now, try to remove the ornament from here. Can you? No, you can't. It's impossible. Why is ornament not ignored so radically in the schools of architecture? Why? Uh, personally, I think we live in sad times where the refrigerator and the parking lot are more important than what we see here. I truly think we live in tragic times. That's why so much boredom, so much uh, apathy, so much lack of exuberance. That's why. You cannot be exuberant doing an incredibly well-proportioned parking lot. In fact, it cannot even be proportioned. You have the dimensions of the um, its majesty, the car that dictates everything. And the same with the refrigerator. You know, our obsessions are so banal. My God, my God. I mean, these builders were, uh, you know, theologians. They were philosophers. They were poets. They knew geometry, they were great mathematicians. Can we compare us with them? No, we can't. We can't. We are banal. Let's face the truth. We are very, very banal and very, very bored. That's the truth. And we must face it. We don't work for beauty. We work for, I don't know what, all kinds of functionless stupidities. Owen Jones, The Grammar of Ornament, some pages from his great book. Um, I actually prefer the book of Ornaments of Sullivan, for example, but this, he, was, he was not a creator as original as uh, Sullivan was. Um, but he was a great collector of uh, ornaments from all history, not just Alhambra, not just Islam. And uh, he Maybe these pages are a little bit tiring because he tried to say too much and he brought too many little details and ornaments together on one page, but the purpose was good. And um, maybe before a grammar of ornament, we need something else. You know, it, the emotions that generate in the ornaments, uh, the grammar, we know what the grammar does also in language. You know, we, uh, the grammar is, you know, is by itself is not poetical, but it's necessary. Yes, we need, we need the grammar as well. All in all, we see here what we saw in the textile works of William Morris. We see a great uh, uh, desire to honor the complexity of the world with a complex work, intricate, labyrinth-like. It's, it's a very intricate world. Why is this, why maybe, maybe we should have on our tables when we work, on one hand, Ernest Neufert, and on the other, the Grammar of Ornament by Owen Jones, together. But no, this is ignored because this has to do with color, with pattern, 
with beauty essentially, and uh, we are not interested in beauty. What is that nonsense word, beauty? What does it mean? You know, we are enlightened rationalists, you know, we love uh, cerebral things, you know, function, 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 forgetting the function of beauty. Beauty also has a function and probably the most important function because beauty speaks to our hearts. But are we interested in our hearts? Of course not. We are only interested in our little calculations that spring from our, for our brain, just as Athena sprang from the brain of Zeus, her father. While Arachne is still scrolling on the, you know, in the, the obscure places of the earth, transformed into a spider. But Arachne was here, William Morris was here. It's, it's a different world and this world needs to be rediscovered. I think this world is very, very important. The world of ornament, the world of intricacies, the world of the labyrinth, the world of a sensitivity which rationally is banished, Neufert banished. The cerebralists of this world banish. They don't like it. They don't like beauty. They, they are not interested in this. They only wait, want white walls and cubicle structures and you know the rest. There isn't much to rest. I mean, look at this. This is abstract. It's, it's very abstract what we see here. So the textile, the Persian rug, we like rugs, right? Well, a, a well done rug, an antique rug, one that is woven genuinely is not mimicking being woven. It's very beautiful because you see its intricacies. It's made of small parts which interconnect and, uh, and uh, the worms of a textile work. And it's used in Romanian villages, you know, uh, uh, the, in rural villages, you see in rural areas, you can see still in old houses, uh, textile works, uh, you know, hanging on the walls and it's it, it, it's truly a warm a warm environment. Sorry, uh, why why no? I shouldn't show this. I already showed it. Sorry. I hope I have something else. Yes, I do. Uh, some of the of the of the materials that I present are uh, uh, you know overlap. So these are pages from the Grammar of Ornament by Owen Jones. And why am I presenting them when is the birthday of William Morris? Because William Morris also was concerned with ornament and he created textile designs which are different from these uh, historical examples that Owen Jones did. But in essence, they both, both works uh, advocate the same thing. The, the, the importance of ornament, ornament, ornament. And in all cultures, except ours, ornament was present and was connected with color, color and color again. The Greek temples were not white, were highly chromatic. Uh, we already talked about, I don't want to repeat what I already said, uh, although maybe just for, uh, yes, here I show a few things which I didn't show previously. So, and I do think uh, Louis Sullivan is very, 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 very important, not just because he said form follows function, but also because of the ornament that he himself created. This was the man and uh, the Liebermeister that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, admired so much, although they had some fights because at one point um, his employee, Frank Lloyd Wright, was stealing the clients from, uh, from Sullivan, so he was fired after five years, but, uh, but still probably somewhere uh, Wright and, and Sullivan kept respecting and admiring each other. Uh, so these are ornaments by the one who said form follows function. Maybe uh, Louis Kahn was wiser when he said form evokes function. Now look at this. Look at this building. It's a famous building by, by, uh, by, by Sullivan. This terracotta work. 
which is highly ornamental. Why did he use it? Why wasn't it? I mean, look at this corner of this building. You, it becomes a tree. The building becomes a tree at the cornice, at the, at the corner. Why? Uh, you know, again, this is the man who uh, was one of the forefathers of, uh, of uh, the cerebral uh, skeletal uh, structure of the, the office tower. Why did he need something like this? Because the complexity of the world cannot be evoked through just the structure, structure, and again structure. No, it would be like a dead tree, which only has a trunk and some branches and no leaves and no flowers in the spring. Look at this column by, uh, by, uh, by Sullivan. Why did he complicate himself? <laughs> Well, because there are emotions in architecture involved, or they should be. And also because, I, based on my reflections, <clears throat> here we, <clears throat> we have the special moment when a column, a vertical element, meets a horizontal element, the beam, right? And there is an intermediate element, the capital, which, which makes the transition, the negotiation between the verticality of the first one and the horizontality of the other one. And so essentially is about the mystery, the mysterious conjunction between two entities which are essentially, um, you know, opposite to each other, you know, the supported and the supporting. And uh, I mean, you know, it's just us today that we, we don't think of using a capital because, uh, uh, you know, we don't complicate ourselves. But look at, look at Sullivan, you know, how much complication he gave birth to. Why? Because this is indeed very important. It's, 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 it's important because this is a place of, of, of difficult negotiations between the vertical element and the horizontal element. And it's supposed to show this, that the difficulty of bringing them together, of joining them. I'm not going to read this. These are, he, he used ornaments through and through. Again, we, we look from a different angle at the same column. Uh, look at these ornaments uh, on, uh, on one of his um, uh, banks that he designed in, later in his life. Uh, all in all, the ornament as advocated by William Morris or advocated by Owen Jones or advocated by Arachne uh, and the other goddesses of, of, of weaving uh, this ornament needs again our concern and interest and love, actually. It should be an expression of love. Enough with a, with a dry, frigid uh, rationalism. Really, enough. Enough is enough. We, we impoverish the world, really. That's it. So happy birthday, William Morris, and uh, thank you for uh, to uh, those of you who are still here. God, 16, we started with three people. <laughs>